Um, great. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Beth. I am the operations manager here at the projects. Uh, welcome to our second of our events discussing how self employed people are supported both during the current crisis and beyond. If you are watching live, please do feel free to post questions in the feed and we will try to answer as many as we can. We held a summit on the 31st of March with a range of experts on self-employed rights and policies. And the recording of that session is available to be viewed on our YouTube channel. We had an incredibly positive response to this event. And we know that many of you still have a number of questions about what happens next. So we are very pleased to welcome Caroline Lucas, MP for Brighton Pavilion, and Phil Jones, MD of Wired Sussex to discuss just that. Caroline and Phil, thank you so much uh, to both of you for be taking the time to be here. Um, Caroline, we know there's been some limited changes um, and updates to the self-employed support scheme uh, since we last spoke. And I know that even from yesterday, you've been incredibly busy raising this issue in Parliament. Uh, could you update us on some of the work that you've been doing? Yeah, thanks so much, Beth, and, and hi, Phil, and, and hi to everyone hi. Who's, who's watching. Um, and just to say thank you to everyone who's been writing to me, raising their concerns about the gaps that still unfortunately remain in the self-employed scheme. So I was just gonna run through some of the work that, uh, that I've been doing um, and then maybe say a little bit about the discretionary fund and the bounce back uh, loans, some of the more recent things that have, that have come in. Um, I mean, in terms of, of raising the ongoing problems, as you'll know, a, a lot of that is to do with not being able to um, access uh, the, the, the fund if you have, um, if you pay yourself in dividends, um, there are issues around um, maternity, paternity, sick leave. Um, I'll, I'll run through the, the things that I've been doing and, and, and that will come out. So essentially, um, I've been leading a cross party application for a dedicated debate in Parliament where ministers would have to face MPs and be subject to some, some real scrutiny. Right now, um, those debates haven't got back up and running again in the virtual form of Parliament, but ours is one of the first in the queue as soon as that does change. And that will be a really important way of ensuring that as many MPs from across the House as possible get to lobby uh, government and, and hear direct, ministers will hear direct from, from MPs on that. I think something that has happened, which is helpful, is that the Treasury Select Committee uh, has got involved in all of this. The Treasury Select Committee, by definition, is a, is a cross-party uh, committee. It has a Conservative um, chair, Mel Stride, um, but the committee has written to the Chancellor, urging him to revisit this scheme, especially the 50,000 cap on the self-employed scheme and the exclusion of the newly self-employed. And I do think that's an important step forward because when government has members of its own party telling them that their schemes are not working properly, that tends to have greater resonance than, than when the opposition does it. So I'm hoping very much that, uh, that they will take notice of that um, Treasury Select Committee submission. The committee also argued that the uh, Treasury should consider widening eligibility by accepting the 2019-2020 results in income calculations. Um, and they flagged the problems that, that some of you have raised with me during our last summit, and which I've been lobbying on, on hard. And that includes what I just mentioned, the fact that workers on maternity or paternity or sick leave during the last three years should be able to pick the highest of the last three years income instead of an average, which basically puts people in that situation at a serious disadvantage when claiming under the self-employed scheme. I've tabled an early day motion, which is basically, a, a, again, a cross-party motion um, highlighting that the self-employed scheme simply doesn't reflect the reality of of working life in Britain today. Um, something that you have all amply demonstrated during and since the last summit. Um, sadly, only about 19 MPs have signed that early day motion so far. And so if you have friends, families and, and colleagues in other parts of the country and you could ask them to sign that, um, or if you could ask them to ask their MPs to sign that, that would be really, really helpful. Um, it's the, the number of the EDM is number 389. But if we could get you know, a, a critical mass behind that early day motion, and it's simply a question of just asking your MP to sign it, then that would get greater sort of resonance, I think, and, and a momentum in, in Parliament. 
There have been a number of opportunities to ask questions, to, to do that in, in oral debates uh, and so on. And so again, just earlier this week, um, I asked the Chancellor to address the problems um, by including issues like small business owners who take their income in dividends, as well as who combine PAYE with freelance, freelance work. Um, and sadly, I mean, I think that, that the point is that he's still not accepting that, Rishi Sunak is still not accepting those two things in particular. But as I said the last time we met, it does feel that there is still scope for ministers to change these schemes as we go forward and to try to backfill some of the gaps. So I do think it is worth you, you know, continuing to keep up the pressure that you already are. But if, if some of you are have MPs who, who aren't in Brighton and Hove, who, who might not yet have been approached about this, then it really is worth contacting them because I think that, you know, that, that there is a potential for, for successful lobbying here and just that repetition of the message from as many MPs as possible um, might, might help. Um, finally, mindful that many self-employed in, in Brighton and Hove are part of the tourism and hospitality sector, um, Again, I think what was interesting to see that there was that there was a letter signed by 50 or over 50 Conservative MPs um, to Rishi Sunak last week, asking him for a package of measures for that sector in particular. And in amongst the things they were calling for was a cut to VAT on tourism. That's something that I've been banging on about for years that most other countries in Europe and beyond have lower rates of VAT for, for tourism you know, typically more like 5%. So um, I'm continuing to push on that. But again, I think there is some glimmer of hope that the fact that 50 Tory MPs think that's a good idea as well, um, perhaps gives us um, some cause for, for, for hope. Just a few words on the, um, on the two new um, uh, packages that have come in. The one is the discretionary fund for small businesses, which was announced on May the 2nd. Uh, when I last checked first thing this morning, there still wasn't um, a list of the criteria uh, it, to, to be really clear about the eligibility for, for those cases. But uh, it's clear that local authorities will have the discretion, but it is also, also sadly uh, clear that businesses, um, the only businesses that can apply for it are those that are not eligible for any other support apart from the job retention scheme. So if you have a grant already or if you're already having some help through the self-employed scheme, then this new discretionary fund for small businesses won't help you. The people it will help are those businesses, for example, in shared offices or other flexible workplaces like units in a retail park, um, which don't have their own business rates or, or their own business rate assessment, which as you'll know is the criteria that's been used for the other schemes. It would cover things like bed and breakfasts, which pay council tax instead of business rates, um, regular market traders and so forth will be covered by it. So it's definitely worth looking out for if you're not already covered by any of the other schemes and the value of the grants are essentially to the value of 25,000, 10,000 or indeed under 10,000. And that discretion is, is, um, is, is at the discretion of the local authority. And then um, you'll have heard I'm, I'm sure about the bounce back loans helping small and medium sized businesses to borrow between 2000 uh, pounds and up to 25% of their toner, turnover maximum loan is, is 50,000. But I also know from many conversations I've had with you that many of you, that the last thing you want is any more loans, even, even if the government guarantees 100% of it and there won't be any fees or interest to pay for the first 12 months. Nonetheless, the point that I'm making right now is that at such an uncertain time, then what businesses need is some support through grants rather than feeling that they're adding more loans to their overall, um, their overall uh, indebtedness, I guess. So that is a quick canter through the issues from my perspective, but uh, I look forward to, to Phil's thoughts. Thank you so much, Caroline, um, for that summary. Um, we're gonna ask you a few more questions about the, uh, your views on the bounce back loans and uh, the discretionary fund for small businesses and some of the uh, nuances of the self-employed scheme. But Phil, just to, um, just to touch in with you, um, mm -hmm. what have Wide Sussex been up to since we last spoke? <laughs> well, um... I guess, I guess um, when there's a crisis, the, from our point of view, the first responders are actually the community. And so what we've tried to do um, is empower that community to support itself. We recognise that there's a, a value in um, arguing for support from the government, and we've been doing that. But our primary focus has been on enabling the community to support itself. 
uh, we set up a, an open Slack group, which has been tremendously successful, and that's enabled um, uh, digital businesses to help each other, to help other businesses, digital businesses to help charities and community groups. And we've even had uh, doctors and other professionals from the NHS um, asking for advice and help and support, which we've been able to give via that group. So it's been incredibly successful. We provide up-to-date information uh, on latest government um, uh, programs. And um, as, as Caroline was saying, some of them aren't 100% clear. So we try and engage with one-to-one -one discussions with people to help them work through whether those programs are relevant to us. But the um, most effective way that group works is it, it provides a platform where other members of the community can provide their expertise, can answer people's needs and can help. So I definitely advise, uh, it's an open Slack group, so anyone can join it. So I definitely advise anyone, any freelancers or small businesses, particularly in the digital, digital sector, but not just in the digital sector, uh, to sign up to that um, tomorrow. You can find the link if you go uh, to the Wired Sussex homepage and find um, uh, there's a COVID banner on the homepage. We've also been um, surveying businesses on a constant basis um, to try and understand what are the sticking points for them, businesses, um, freelancers and shared workspaces. And that's because we want to make sure that what we're doing is relevant to their needs in these incredibly uh, unusual and uncertain times, but also because um, we're engaging with government, local and national government now, um, uh, and we have a regular call with DCMS, with the Minister for Digital, um, where all the um, significant digital clusters around the country are kind of represented, and we work together to focus the attention of the Minister on particular challenges and help her to understand where some government policies maybe aren't impacting in the way that they expect to or are having unintended consequences. Um, we've obviously focused a lot as, as has other sectors, Manchester, Bristol, Newcastle and others on the challenges around freelancers, some of which are covered, many of which aren't. Some of the provision is good, some of it isn't. But we've also focused on the, um, the challenges around the business interruption loans, which clearly weren't working. So um, it was clear that banks, um, even though the government was um, agreeing to cover 80% uh, of the risk of those loans, banks were not prepared to cover the other 20%. So they were stalling those loans and so we pushed very hard around that and I think that's um, you know along with a number of other people I have to say who've been pushing very hard around it and I think the consequence of that is the bounce back loans and as Caroline said um, they're not perfect they're not perfect by a long chalk but actually for a number of businesses we're talking to they're a bit of a lifesaver. The other thing we push back on is, a, is shared workspaces. So particularly in Brighton, but not just in Brighton, you know, co-working spaces, innovation hubs, those workspaces, which are really, really important to freelancers and to small startups uh, were left out of the mix, if you like, uh, when it came to government support. And so we focused on those. As Caroline said, the new scheme looks to help some of the businesses um, who uh, use those co-working spaces, but it's at the discretion of the local authorities. Our understanding is even if you're running an Airbnb, you could probably claim under that, which seems inappropriate and, is, and seems uh, like an unintended consequence, um, but we're still trying to get to grips with that. So um, that's a kind of overview, I think, of the work that we've been doing um, since we last spoke, Beth. Thank you so much, Phil. Incredible work and absolutely just showing the power and of this community working together to uh, 
it show that we when we do lobby and we do put that pressure on and um, things really start to change um obviously you're in touch phil with a lot of your um members at wide sussex um can you just give us a quick uh how is everyone feeling um how are your members uh, coping with everything at the moment um so i think um we've seen them go through a couple of stages so the first stage was um fear actually you know there was um uh, a, a real challenge um and uh we needed to move quickly to kind of triage and you know triage some of the biggest problems um we moved away from that to what some people are calling uh, the new normal so to some extent businesses um are understanding how they might begin to survive through the process, sometimes by taking on loans, sometimes by pivoting their business, sometimes by trying to, you know, uh, put their business into a holding pattern for the short term. It's true to say, though, that there is a not insignificant minority of, of, of uh, digital businesses who are actually not suffering as a consequence of, of the crisis. So if you look at our website at the moment, there's 60 uh, games companies, 60 um, vacancies that games companies in the city are advertising at the moment. So, <laughs> you know, whilst on the one hand, any digital business is, that's kind of engaged with the real world is engaged with um, the tourist economy or retail or those kind of things to some extent has suffered significantly. Those that only exist in a, in a digital realm are like games companies and like remote working uh, facilitating companies are actually kind of doing all right and could grow given um, uh, given access to talent. So weirdly, whilst we're looking at the one hand on some people being made redundant or struggling, on the other hand, we've got businesses who want to recruit that can't. That's really good. That's such an interesting point. Um, Caroline, just to talk things that you uh, mentioned in your summary um, um, about the uh, the updates to the uh, support schemes that the government are providing. Um, in particular, um, paying attention to the bounce back loans and the discretionary fund for small businesses. Um, in your opinion, do these fill the gaps that we identified last time? No, uh, I mean, obviously any help is, is is welcome and as Phil said for, for, for some of the bounce back loans in particular can be a, a, a lifesaver. Um, but I think, you know, again, the criteria tend to be drawn so tightly that, you know, when you hear a discretionary fund for small businesses, you might think, hurrah, I might have a better chance of being able to explain to the council why I need a discretionary fund and, and, and they might well, you know, be able to, to know the business and, and know the context and therefore be more sympathetic to giving that fund. And yet, in fact, the amount of discretion the council actually has is not very much. The discretionary fund appears to be far more the government's discretion rather than the local authority when it comes to the criteria, at least. Um, and so it's, um, you know, I think it is problematic that that you're only allowed um, to access the um, the discretionary fund if, if you're not eligible for any other uh, support. Um, and it's still, I think, definitely a problem that um, that if you have a rateable value over 51,000, then you're, you're not likely to be covered because we know that a lot of um, a lot of uh, businesses in the city, you know, they can still be small businesses, but they might just have, you know, quite high rates, as we, as we know in the city that, 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 that businesses do. So I think there's a, a real problem with the tightness with which the um, the criteria are being are being fixed by government. And what I would love to have seen would have been rather more flexibility so that we could have had the council itself being able to make um, more of those decisions rather than um, rather than being set at, at the government level. Do you do you believe that um, there, as you said, quite often you know there is kind of like a, some glimmer of hope. Do you believe that if we continue to put the pressure, and um, that the, the local authorities might be able to take more, um, have a bit more leeway with the uh, with the guidelines? I think the pressure would need to be put on 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 ministers rather than the local authority. I don't think they could you know move outside the scope that they've been given. 
but certainly I still think it's worth, you know, all of the work that Phil and everyone else is, is doing, speaking directly to ministers, certainly, because I think, you know, the problems that we're facing here in this city are, are felt in, in many cities around, around the country and many people will be making the same case. And I think one of the interesting things to me over the last few weeks and months has been just how, in a sense, it's been backbenchers from, from all parties who are raising these issues. It's not actually fallen down on, on, on narrow party lines. You know, there are plenty of Conservative MPs, as I mentioned just earlier, for example, who are concerned about businesses in the hospitality and, and uh, uh, tourism sector in particular. So I think, you know, as, as much noise as we can keep making, then I think there is a chance that they will keep backfilling some of these gaps. Um, you know, for example, the, the prohibition against being able to be eligible if you if you take part of your of your income in, in uh, freelance and part PAYE, it doesn't seem to be on be beyond the wit of, of of a bit of thinking to work out how you could come up with a, a reasonable package for those people, and it seems completely completely wrong and and, and arbitrary that that those people aren't able to be covered by the scheme. And I appreciate you know people at Westminster no doubt are working very hard too, and in Whitehall and perhaps there's only a certain amount of bandwidth for making one change at a time, but the more we keep this pressure up, uh, I, I think that, that, that there's still certainly hope and still certainly worth doing that. Great, thank you, Caroline. Um, Phil, um, as you've mentioned, um, it's been brilliant that the bounce back loans have uh, been introduced. Um, and whilst the government are paying the interest for the first 12 months, they still require newly self-employed people to take on debt at a time where their income is likely to have been seriously reduced. Uh, what's your view on that? Do you feel that that's fair? Yeah, so I think, um, I, I think for certain businesses, they are a lifeline. Um, and some freelancers, they are a lifeline because, um, you know, let's be honest, the terms aren't bad. You know, you don't have to pay, you know, they're 100% guaranteed by the government. So that enables the banks to le lend the money much more easily. They're more likely to do that. There are, you know, the, 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 there's no costs associated with that. So they're covered by the government. It's a very low interest rate um, as well when the interest rate kicks in and it's capped at 2.5%. So it's not, you know, it could be a lot, lot worse. However, like a lot of those things, and, and you know, it's the point that Caroline's making, I think, is that people, it, they're broad brushes and, you know, therefore they don't solve everyone's problems. And um, what you then have to do is come forward and argue that there are people missing from those. So for some freelancers, it will, you know, for some, if I'm not a, a financial advisor, so, um, you know, get some independent advice here. But, you know, if I was a freelancer that had run up large debts trying to survive on my credit card, I may think that a balance back loan at much lower rate, you know, may be a more appropriate way of dealing with the current crisis. Um, I think on the discretionary loan, uh, you know, one of the challenges is, is the discretionary element should be, as Caroline said, about local and regional discretion, because it's got this blanket um, UK wide £51,000 cap on uh, rateable value of businesses. That means something very different in Brighton, London and Middlesbrough. So what the discretion should be and, and this is you know the argument that we're going to be making to government is the discretion should be to allow local authorities to manage those funds bearing in mind local challenges and local needs absolutely um just switching tact a little bit um a key theme on social media at the moment is communication um, and I was just asking you uh, Caroline um, do you believe that the government's communications on self-employed support have been clear enough um, there's been things like el eligibility checkers and timelines for receiving grants those have been circulating on circulating on social media but there seems to be a lack of clarity about what to go for and for when um, so two questions and do you think it's been clear enough and if not what's the best way for people to get straight answers well, it won't come as any surprise to you to hear that. I don't think that uh, the government's been clear on, on, on this any more than they've been clear on anything else they've been announcing recently, unfortunately. Um, and I would love to have a, 
you know, a, a, a shortcut for people to be able to find out, for example, when we're going to get more information about the, um, the discretionary fund for small businesses. Um, as I say, we, we've just been basically checking the website uh, every day since May the 2nd when it was first announced. Um, and we're still checking to see when there's going to be more information about it. And, and that's just kind of soul destroying for, for, for businesses that really, and, and individuals who really, really depend on, on this stuff coming through. So I, I, I think what's tended to happen again and again, and not just in, in this field, but, but throughout what's been happening over the past few weeks and months is you get an announcement and then you have to wait for days, if not weeks before you get the detail of what it actually means. And in the meantime, you're just left with so many questions and so much uncertainty. And I just wish they'd do the homework first and then make the announcement so that when they make the announcement, you know, the website is there, the criteria are there, the application form is there, the banks are ready when that's necessary to actually pay some of this stuff out because we've got quite a lot of casework around some banks at least being very slow in paying out some of this uh, money. Um, so it just seems to be that, you know, it's, it's sort of, it's government by headline. So you have the headline and then you get the sense that there are civil servants in Whitehall scurrying behind trying to, to work out what on earth they can put in place to make the headline uh, real. So I, I think it's really frustrating and, and you know, I'm smiling, but it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's an absolute crisis for so many people in the city. And, and my, I've never seen anything like this, to be honest, my, my, my mailbox, email box is just full of so many people who are just really feeling increasingly desperate, I think, because, because the, the, there isn't the clarity that there needs to be in terms of what people should do right now. I agree. And um, does that, is that echoed in the Wired Sussex community, uh, Phil? Yeah, yeah I mean, definitely. Um, uh, you know, we haven't got the national leadership that we need or deserve for this crisis. And um, you can see that almost daily. In, in as Caroline said, the confusion over announcements, um, the confusion in trying to understand what the announcements mean. Um, yeah, it's in, in, incredibly problematic. I and mean, I can't actually sum it up better than the way that Caroline's just done it. Absolutely. Um, so it's a really, uncertain time um, and as you've sort of echoed um, Phil there are some people some businesses that are really struggling and, and then there's some businesses that are um, you know doing well which is obviously great we want our um, city to thrive. Um, what is the outlook for micro and small businesses in your opinion? Well that's so such an it all depends I think question because it all depends on what kind of um, economic future we build from this crisis and that's um, still to be determined I mean that's still um, a, a future yet to be built so I think that's you know the primary challenge at the moment is I think that we think about the opportunities, I mean, it's a terrible thing to say, but the opportunities that this crisis can give us to rethink how we think about um, our economy, how, particularly how we think about our economy in this city and the way that some other cities are already doing. I mean, Amsterdam, it seems to me, is, is, is doing a fantastic job looking at rethinking the way that economy works in order to grow out of this. I, you know, to come back to the point I, I, I guess I made earlier about the fact that, you know, um, there are still significant job vacancies um, in the city in spite of all this. Uh, you know, I think that in certain sectors, probably large retailers, you know, there's going to be some car crashes out of this. You know, they were um, full of debt, ch challenged and struggling before this. Uh, uh, we probably see the end of the kind of department store and stuff like that. There will be people who are unemployed as a consequence of this. You know, we need to think about how we help them get equipped with the skills that they're going to need for well-paid, you know, future employment. Um, and, and part of that, it's not the only solution, but part of that is digital skills. You know, we need to be thinking, what's the Marshall Plan for people who are suffering as a consequence of this and how can we as a city actually lead in that so i think that you know there there is both um concern amongst our members but i think we can turn that into a kind of opportunity you know 
an opportunity to rethink and reformulate and think about things in new way. Even when we come out of this, we'll still have, and Caroline can definitely talk to this much better than me, but we'll still have a climate crisis to kind of deal with. So we'll still have those challenges as a society. Brighton should be leading the way. Thank you. And Caroline, maybe you could just touch on that. What do we want to see in the future? Um, how can we make sure that uh, self-employed people, but the whole of the Brighton Hope community and the nation, get support and security? Well, I think there's a real sense that we're at a crossroads in, in terms of whether we do just go back to normal or whether or not we recognise that normal was intolerable for huge numbers of people and was also trashing the planet. And it does feel that, that there is a moment here now where we could bring a new kind of intentionality, if you like, to, to how we build back. And there are lots of campaigns out there with names like Build Back Better or, you know, uh, Green Rescue Plans and so forth. And, and it does feel that maybe, just maybe, we will learn from our failure to have built back better after the financial crash. You know, the financial crash was, was dreadful in itself, but it was made even more dreadful by 10 years of austerity. And the fact that the responsibility for paying for austerity fell on the shoulders of those least able to, to cope with it and least responsible for the crash. And it does feel that maybe there's a greater understanding across society and, and, and across the political sphere that we can't do that again. And that there is an opportunity to make sure that we come through this crisis in a way that not only doesn't exacerbate the climate crisis but actually ameliorates it and so there are some you know there are some signs of hope for example you know greens in the city have been banging on for ages about more cycle lanes and more roads to be pedestrianized and so forth and now we're beginning to see that happen and i think the challenge will be to see whether or not we can really hold on to some of those positive things like you know getting the air pollution um, much less serious in the city than it is right now and maybe making it easier or definitely making it easier for people to move around the city without needing to be um, uh, you know, driving their cars. And part of that when it comes to business as well is recognizing I think that, that generally speaking there is more resilience in a local economy that is more diverse and isn't just dependent on one or two uh, big businesses that if they go under then, then you know, that's really serious for, for the whole city. So. It feels to me that you know there's more and more understanding that that coming out of this pandemic we need to be investing in the green economy not only because of the climate crisis but also because as many reports have shown just in the last few weeks if you invest in the green economy it tends to have much quicker and better returns on investment you know you're you're, you're, you're lots of these things you know like like you know let's say having a, a mass insulation scheme for, for, for buildings in britain that would create jobs in every constituency, it would get people's fuel bills down, it would, it would get climate emissions down. And crucially, you don't have to wait for ages to get that up and running. True, you would need some, some, some training schemes put in place pretty quickly to train up more people. But essentially that could be an absolute godsend for communities up and down the country where you wanna get people back to work quickly. So I think if we can have some imagination when it comes to business and, and link that to some, some imagination when it comes to how we keep ourselves economically secure and I've been interested how how much interest is that there is now in the idea of a, a universal basic income again something the Greens have been banging on about in the wilderness for decades suddenly you've got Conservative MPs popping up saying perhaps we need this and and a greater recognition across the political spectrum that universal credit isn't working that however we end up going back to work after this crisis it's not going to be in you know a nine to five job that you're in for 30 years that people are constantly going to be moving in and out of of part-time work or full-time work flexible and our current welfare system just cannot keep up with that we know it can't it doesn't even already much less if people are moving in and out much more regularly you know if the lockdown comes down for a bit and then gets lifted universal credit can't possibly keep up with that whereas a universal basic income payable to everybody as of right would guarantee people that 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 minimum security and out of that what you've seen where some of these uh, schemes have been introduced as pilot schemes you actually have a flourishing of entrepreneurship and people coming up with ideas for new businesses and it gives people the security to put a toe in that water if they haven't already done so and to begin and to begin to build something different so i think there's all to play for even though right now i do accept that these are very very scary and uncertain times and i guess i guess in terms of freelancers 
I mean, there's a couple of, um, and they're self-employed. There's a couple of things that I think that, that, that hopefully can come out of this. First of all, that self-employment should be a choice that people make. So at the moment, you know, some people are forced into self-employment so that a large, uh, some large employers can avoid having to take um, uh, people as staff on their books. So it should be a choice. But where it is a choice, it's a legitimate choice. So sometimes it feels like self-employment is seen um, as a second rate choice, but it's not. It's as as legitimate a choice as, as working for a company, working for a corporate, starting your own business. They're absolutely fine choices they're individual choices that people make because of the circumstances in their lives and if that's the choice that they make then we need to and, and we need to recognize that freelancers make a huge contribution to the economy so I think you know we need to resist some of the um, mood music that came from the Chancellor about, well, if we give freelancers this break now, we'll be coming back for it in some kind of tax later on. There are other other organisations that you can go for in terms of tax, which would be much more legitimate, to be honest, than freelancers. Um, and we need to find ways to support them. You know, free, typically, most learning is on the job in companies. Freelancers don't get that opportunity. So how can we help freelancers to continue to upskill in a, you know, in a, in a challenging economic environment? That's also why we put so much emphasis into shared workspaces, because shared workspaces increase the ability of freelancers to work with others, to learn from each other, to share opportunities that otherwise they wouldn't get. So they're a vital part of the ecosystem for the whole city and a vital part of the way that we support our freelance community to support our economy. Thank you so much, Phil. Um, talking of our community, um, I've got some questions. Lots of people have been asking uh, questions for the two of you. Um, and uh, our, our, uh, Phil and Caroline will do their best to uh, answer them. <laughs> very specific. Um, so um, I think that maybe this one's best for you, Caroline. Um, one of our members from the projects community has asked, um, um, it would be great to hear um, if the government, if you think the government will have plans to extend the self-employed grant up until October um, in line with um, the job and the furlough. Again, there's been that disparity between um, self-employed and employed. Um, yes, I would have thought they they would. I mean, it was interesting, as you say, that, that the self-employed scheme came about almost it felt like an afterthought when the government suddenly remembered that, that there's a whole load of people out there who are who are um, self-employed and so it's interesting that their first go-to place is, is the kind of work that they understand better which is you, you know the the, the the scheme that they put in for the um, job retention scheme and furloughing but I think it would be I think it would be incredible that they wouldn't also apply the same kind of criteria to to the self-employed scheme but again it's frustrating that why couldn't they have announced those things together I, I don't know um, and so there'll be more lobbying undoubtedly to make sure that they do bring in the same um, the same rules for the self-employed scheme as well um, I should introduce Kath who's my chief of staff who people can't see because her internet connection is not terribly good at the moment but she is lurking there Kath I just wondered do, have you heard anything about extending it to the self-employed scheme no, I suspect one of the things it'll be based on is how much it costs them. And of course, they don't know that yet because it's only just opened. But I suspect that will be a really key factor in their decision making. But we'll certainly be pressing for that because I can't see any justification for why there should not be equality between you know, people who are employed and those who are self-employed. And I just think this is just another example of how, frankly, the government doesn't really understand the self-employed sector and always keeps thinking of them as second class and the one they come to afterwards. Um, and, and just an under, a thing as well, I think that they just, you know, as, as, as Phil was saying, self-employed should be a choice. Right now, all sorts of people are self-employed and it's not just this stereotype that the government might have of, of, of people with, with plenty of money and, you know, a, a, a great idea and they're, they're in their attics, you know, planning this great idea and they've got savings to back up on, you know, all sorts of people from cleaners to drivers are, are self-employed and they need exactly the same support as people who are in the uh, employed sector. 
Absolutely. Um, and I'm here in my attic at the moment. I was so, let's think now, actually. <laughs> <laughs> a mad man in his attic. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. <laughs> um, a quick question on um, on the job retention scheme. Obviously, it is welcome that it's being extended um, to October. Um, while this is a uh, catch up about self employed, a lot of um, small businesses in Brighton are employers, and it's really important um, for our whole economy. Um, how do you feel, Caroline, about um, the uh, small businesses of Brighton and the nation uh, being asked to make up the deficit of um, the furlough scheme? I mean, I think it's really worrying. And I think, again, it's just yet more uncertainty because we don't know how much they're going to have to make up. So, you know, it was just another typical example where on the one hand, you know, we had the announcement earlier in the in the, in the week that, that the scheme will continue. So there's a big tick, good, we want that scheme to continue. But then there's this kind of small print that still hasn't been filled in that, um, that after August, then employers will be asked to, to make a contribution towards it. And so how much is that going to be? And what about those businesses? I think which is particularly relevant in, in, in Brighton and Hove, if as we expect, the hospitality industry is one of the last to come back because by definition, it's that much harder to keep social distance if you're in a restaurant or a pub or whatever, then could you have a situation where even though pubs and restaurants haven't been able to open, so there's no particular demand, um, they haven't been able, yeah, so they haven't got any income coming in and yet they're being asked to pay yet more. Oh, sorry. <laughs> is that you? <laughs> that is. That's so exciting, but it's not exciting for this to happen just now. Sorry, um, I don't know how to stop it. That is a curly that I've been waiting to make that noise. <laughs> I just forgot it was on my screen. Just a minute. <laughs> just a minute. I don't need to get you back now, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll explain later, but that was actually very exciting. And I forgot it was open on my computer. Um, yeah, so the worry is that you could have businesses that um, still aren't able to open and yet are still being required to contribute an as un yet unknown amount to the, um, to, 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 to the furloughing scheme. So once again, why could you not wait and announce the package together so people know? You know, I don't think he really recognizes just how much uncertainty it causes people you know just to have this constant information being dripped out instead of having a package a clear package so people know what they're dealing with absolutely i really I noticed that from the community that i run it's just the constant anxiety of not like come on like, let's just all have it at once and then we can assess it um, and it was even it was actually even worse with the furlough announcement because i think boris johnson hinted about it first didn't he then the chancellor announced it without giving details so it's this kind of drip feeding of, of stuff and you're right um you know it's it's welcome that the furlough um uh, scheme has been extended but on what basis you know what are the caveats what are the challenges how do you prepare for something that you don't have the detail around as a business it's almost impossible absolutely uh, to move to, uh, the next question. um previously in our um we touched a lot on um, self-employed uh, mothers um without maternity leave um who are particularly vulnerable um do you, what support do you think that they can get from the government or is there any support elsewhere? Um, obviously that's a very specific question, but maybe Caroline, do you know if there's any support from the government at the moment? I don't think, I, I'm not aware, and, and, and Kath will jump in if, I'm, if I misremember, but, but I'm not aware of any other support scheme out there that we haven't already touched on. But I think the questioner is absolutely right that there is a real gender discrimination here, given that when you look at people who don't necessarily have a full three years earnings to, to, to point back to. A lot of those people will be women who've taken time out to have kids, to look after kids and so forth. And um, I mean, I must admit, I haven't looked to check whether or not this is happening, but it feels to me like this ought to be a major campaign, and maybe it is, for groups like Mumsnet and others, you know, who do have an incredibly strong voice because they cover so many people and they are by definition non-party. Um, you know, I, I would hope that this will be something that will be massively taken up by those organisations, as well as many MPs I know, including myself, have been making this point that there is a, a very clear discrimination essentially going on with the way that this scheme is designed. So we'll keep doing that. But but if anyone has any influence with those other organisations, I think we just need to, to, to really, yeah, to, to really make a big noise on it. 
we will try our best to find out if uh, any of our information and and I guess and I guess that, that may well be exacerbated because um, if uh, the government starts encouraging people to go back to work before they encourage the schools to open, then there's going to be an incredible pressure on uh, families generally, but often, you know, on uh, women in the families to to deal with that. Um, so I think it could be exacerbated. Yeah. Um, Phil, I think this is one for you. Um, do you think that businesses will benefit in the long run from the increase in digital literacy all around? I think um, they can. So I think um, the, the, there's real opportunities for businesses to um, get better at serving um, their audiences, their clients, their customers, and serving those people's needs um, using digital technology in the right way. Um, absolutely, that's possible. And we've started to see both the um, strengths, but also the challenges around that through, um, through, through this whole uh, kind of lockdown period. So we've started to see people um, migrate to virtual meetings, virtual calls like this, um, and other ways of virtually working. A lot of those systems aren't yet able to reproduce, you know, some of the important ways that um, business engages in a physical way. And often the infrastructure isn't strong enough to deal with the increased demand around digital. Um, and also, as I said, there, I think there's a real challenge around the, the skills that are kind of needed. So, you know, there's a real demand in, in our sector for um, people with the right level of skills, and that's not being met. And that is a, um, uh, slowing the growth of our sector in this city. But also, actually, every business needs some digital knowledge you know, as we go forward. And so digital skills need to be a part and parcel of what we do. I would, the only thing I would say is I would uh, caution, you know, when we talk to the government, they often talk about um, a tech led recovery. And I would caution that way of thinking about it. I think it's a needs led recovery of which tech pays a very important part. That's the way that I would frame it. Great. Um, Phil, another one for you. Um, have you got any uh, sort of standout uh, or the creative ways that businesses have adapted to this difficult time? Anything that's been really um, surprising, interesting, from more Brighton and Hope? Um, oh, that's a good question. I mean, the one that <laughs> um, I'll give you one that, um, so uh, I'll give you um, a couple one close to home is that wide sussex um every april usually runs um a, a talent festival which is four days of jobs fairs portfolio clinics skills summits and all those kind of things and it attracts thousands of people each year um, and a variety of different um venues across the city this year with just three weeks notice, we moved the whole thing online. So we still run it over four days on different platforms. We still engage with people around, you know, we got um, uh, 20 creative companies to give one-to-one -one online sessions to people who are interested in creative careers in the digital sector. We gave advice and, and instituted phone lines to give people who are leaving college or university who um, are really nervous at the moment about how to come into the city. Um, and amazingly, the, the, the diff one of the differences was a lot of those people we were talking to were in Toronto or Berlin or um, Newcastle, as well as just in Brighton. So, you know, it was a way of attracting new um new uh, talent to the city, I think. Doing it in three weeks is really, really challenging. So um, I wouldn't advise it. The other thing, the other one that came up, I think, were, um, um, on um, 
uh, a very specific one, but on, on uh, one of the things we facilitated through our Slack group was we had an NHS anaesthetist uh, contact us through it, and uh, she had an idea, you may have read about this, but she had an idea to create kind of flashcards to in order to engage with people who are, um, who have the virus and, you know, um, were um, groggy because they were under anaesthetic um, using these cards. And um, she thought it was such a good idea. She wanted other countries to be able to access it. So we, um, uh, some, uh, we helped some businesses to build her a website, which, as they said, would usually take them four weeks in 72 hours in order for hospitals in other country to also access this flashcards. And now um, 50 hospitals around the world are using that website. Um, and, and so that's a fantastic example, I think, of how you, know, you can rise to the challenge, even if the challenge is a hard one. Absolutely, it's been really heartening um, in all the communities that I've been watching in Brighton and Hove to see uh, people who are being so innovative, which I think is what this city is uh, absolutely best at. Um, and it's been amazing. I mean, Caroline, do you have any um, highlights that you'd like to add to? I've just been enjoying just watching how some of the literary festivals and others have moved online. Obviously, that's a much easier thing to, to move online in a way. And I know Brighton Festival is going to be uh, moving some of its stuff online. And, and I'm having a conversation shortly with uh, Josh at the Warren about, about what they're doing, um, which is a bit easier than what, uh, the, what Phil was describing. But one thing that I did watch, which was amazing, was how practically whole orchestras have come together to, um, to produce a piece of music with people playing in different in different places and different rooms. How that works, I haven't a clue, but I was pretty impressed by it, I have to tell you. Um, just very quickly, um, we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, we've been just touching on um, uh, self-employed and then the job retention scheme a little bit. There still is a sense um, in uh, communications from the government and the general consensus that um, small business directors are still kind of falling through the cracks. And uh, Stuart Davies has asked, has there been any more conversations about the situation? Um, and uh, I know that you were in government um, lobbying for this yesterday, Caroline. Um, is there any more going on with that? I mean, there is a heck of a lot going on in terms of the lobbying. I mean, MPs can um, call for so-called urgent questions, which makes the minister have to come to the chamber to, to, to answer, you know, why, for example, there are still gaps in these schemes. Um, they're obviously feeling under pressure to make regular statements uh, in the chamber. Um, there, there are, you know, any number of opportunities for, for MPs to keep raising this. And so, you know, what I would say is that although you know, from, from, you know, waiting for something to happen, it can often feel like, well, you know, where is the process? What is actually happening? I mean, I know that MPs from all parties are raising this the whole time through select committees, like, like the Treasury Select Committee that I mentioned, through one-to-one -one conversations with ministers, through, I mean, I have um, a, a phone call with the Prime Minister from time to time because I count as one of the uh, opposition leaders, albeit a, a leader of one. Um, so, so it is being raised a huge amount. And I guess I would want people to really know that. Um, it might not feel much consolation because what you need is action, not words, but just to let people know that there, it is being raised all the time. It is something that people are really appraised of because in constituencies around the country, you, you know, similar conversations to these are happening. So I know it's not fast enough and we'll keep doing everything that we possibly can, but um, yeah, it, it, it's going on. There is one thing happening which is very frustrating, which is really stupid, which is that, um, that Parliament does stop for a week um, as of the end of next week, uh, at least the, the, the processes in Parliament stop for a week, um, which is really ironic because Jacob Rees-Mogg has been wishing on about how, you know, we need to set an example and how, you know, which, which we do, but the example we should be setting is not, you know, suddenly not being in Parliament for that week. So there will be a slightly quieter week the week after next in terms of what's actually happening uh, in Parliament. Great. Thank you, Caroline. Um, well, I think that's the uh, kind of the highlights of the questions. Um, 
but unless you have anything else to add, I know that people are very curious, uh, Caroline, about what the noise was, why it was. <laughs> 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 one of the <laughs> one of the interesting things about about these last uh, weeks is is that it has given me more of a chance to um to try to reconnect with 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 nature. So I've got my swift box on the front of the house, and in the in the uh, evenings, from from where I live, you can hear the sound of of me playing the sound of swifts making the sound to try to attract them in because that's what you're meant to do. But the sound just then, I was <laughs> I had been watching a an, a curlew nest and. There's, it's beautiful. Um, I, I'll send you the link actually, because if people need a bit of restoration and, and hope right now, it's the most beautiful thing. It's in Cambridge, and it's a real close-up of a camera on this curlew. And when the when the uh, parent curlew swap in terms of sitting on the nest, then there's there's a fantastic display and lots of noise and so forth. And so for most of the day, you forget that the thing is there because it's quiet and you've got other stuff in front of it. But obviously what happened just then was that the <laughs> other curly had come back to take over on the nest. And um, yeah, <laughs> I'll send it definitely send it out to people because we need we need a bit of reminders that Absolutely. nature is still there, thank God. Um, Phil, do you have anything else to add or anything that you'd like to um, uh, share? Any uh, birds you'd like to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, halfway through our talk, I had a bumblebee flying around my head in the, in the uh, I'm the madman with a bee in the attic, actually, uh, <laughs> Caroline. <laughs> um, <laughs> But uh, and I thought, oh my god, I can't swat a bee, you know. What? Well, <laughs> <laughs> in the act. <laughs> I just have to let it sting me. <laughs> no, um, thank, thanks very. Actually, thank um, thank you, Beth, and the project for organising both of these events. I think they they've been uh, incredibly useful um, and interesting, and I, I know how much effort goes into organising them. So thank you very much. Thank you. thank you both for joining us. Um, so again, thank you so much, uh, Caroline and Phil, uh, for joining us and giving us uh, such valuable information and support to our self-employed community. Um, it's not in my notes, but um, I think it's really important for us to recognise that you know the more we speak, the more we join as a communal voice and as a united voice, uh, the more it gets done. I mean, I mean, the, it's it's such an uncertain time and there's so much fear. Um, at the moment, but what's been incredible to witness uh, and to be part of in this city is how much people care and how much people um, use their voice to uh, put pressure on the government. So thank you also, Caroline, for uh, <laughs> being our voice in, in, in Parliament. Um, if anyone has any further questions or concerns about the situation for the self-employed people of Brighton, also small businesses, which obviously make up the large majority um, of our economy. Um, please do feel free to email us at hello at the projects um, dot space um, and we'll do our best to help. We're talking to lots and lots of different people behind the scenes, I think like Phil and Caroline. So we are really trying to do our best to join up the dots um, where some of the communication has been lacking with uh, the government communications. Um, so thank you both to uh, Caroline and Phil for your time and thank you guys for watching and please stay safe and um, look after yourselves. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Cheers.